Hey, how's it going dudes and dudettes? Brad the Guitologist here. Uh, recently did a video on this Mesa. It had some pots in it from like 1985. Now I know the Mesa Mark II B apparently had ended production, what, in, in around 83 or 84. So maybe it's not an 85, I really don't know. But there's there are definitely some pots in here that scream to me. 1985. I don't know if um, those were added later. Uh, I do have some evidence that this thing was sent back in 1991. And that's the reason for our second video here. Uh, you can see over here on the side, there's an RA number. That's a return authorization number. Uh, they gave, so they gave this guy a number. His name was something, something Thompson. Looks like maybe G. Thompson. And that right there looks to me like maybe... 10 slash 91 so I think this thing was sent back in 1991 to the Mesa factory probably to have some work done and maybe at the time they also convinced the owner to do uh, check out some of the mods that they were offering for these one of those mods was pointed out to me by uh, a viewer of my last video I'll put a link up here you should probably watch that video before you watch this one if you're interested in in this amp um, so that link will be up here but I wanted to, to get back into this thing because uh, the, the commenter in that other video pointed out that this has a modification that was a popular modification uh, for a few years there on this particular model. And what it basically did was it moved the effects loop. So this thing, as I pointed out in that last video, has some inconsistencies with the schematic. It sounds great. Um, I have no complaints with the sound. Got a lot of gain even with the 12AU7 that I put in the V1 position, which I mean, you would think that a 12AU7 in a V1 position when the thing calls for a 12AX7 would really severely diminish its ability to break up, but I didn't find that to necessarily be the case at all. In fact, it, it really had a lot of gain on tap left. So uh, anyway, though, I, I uh, kind of determined the last time I was going through this thing, and I think I might have even lost some clips because I, I distinctly remember going through the schematic, but I didn't uh, find the clips when I came to edit. So anyway... We're, what we're going to do in this video, we're going to go through this amp because there is an effects loop uh, that comes off, it's supposed to, on the factory uh, schematic, it's supposed to come off of a cathode follower on V2A. Okay, so V2A would be this, V2 is this guy, and th you'll notice that there are a lot of what look like modifications in this area anyway we've got we've got a, a capacitor over here that's piggybacked on another capacitor you can see that right there clearly so that was added we've got one we've got a couple of different styles of resistor in here already we've got a uh, like i count like three different ones this resistor right here is the style of resistor that mesa would have been using about 1991 i believe so that to me screams evidence of this thing having gone back uh around 1991 for some modifications so mike bendinelli i think is the guy's last name at mesa he does this particular modification at, at mesa on these one of the things involves adding this potentiometer back here that controls the level this is a post effects level that they have this labeled as but the thing is, to make it a post-effects level, they actually had to change where the effects loop is positioned in the amplifier. Uh, on the original schematic, it's positioned on V2A as a cath coming off of a cathode follower. So a cathode follower pushes signal uh, through the effects loop. And if there's nothing plugged into the effects, of course, it just shorts straight across. And you've got essentially what amounts to an unused potential gain stage right here on the V2A stage. So the thing is, uh, what they end up doing, I believe, and now I don't know this for sure, but I believe they take this effects loop and they move it a stage later. So they put it over here with this lead master and the regular master volume. 
And I think they probably put it over here after these master volumes. So you've got master volumes that run into the effects loop at that point. And you can see right here, this is the junction of the, uh, the EQ. So here's where the switch for the EQ gets switched either in or out. And it takes both of these switches at the same time to switch it in or out. Uh, otherwise, this all of this circuitry right here would load things down if this was still switched in. So they need both switches on a relay to do this. So that's how they accomplish the switching here. You can see if it's off, then it just bypasses all this and goes straight to this point. This is a preamp uh, preamp out or power amp in. Don't get confused by that. It's a preamp out is what it is. But it sets right here before the phase inverter. And uh, it is right here that is that jack right there here is the pot the pot is actually connect you see the yellow wire right there so the pot is actually connected with that yellow wire to that jack so this that pot is sitting right here basically before this jack or at the same junction of this jack what you have is the effects here i believe now we're gonna confirm that and what i want to do is um, try to see how the actual wiring in this example is different than what's on the schematic so i think this is be the first time anyone's done this uh as far as i know on a video i searched for this and i didn't see anybody who had done it who had actually traced out the schematic for uh what mike bendinelli uh, referred to as the mesa mark ii b plus he called it the b plus after having this mod done and that means basically that this has now an extra gain stage now that it did not have before so this will He's converted this into a normal gain stage, whereas before it was a cathode follower. But we're going to confirm that, and I want to trace out the schematics. So, uh, yeah, stick around to the end of this video, and we'll see exactly what the schematic looks like on a Mesa Mark II B+, which is kind of the lost Mesa model. We have some more evidence here that this uh, went back to Mesa in the 1990s. I really didn't mention this in the last video, but it did occur to me that all of these capacitors in the power section, all of these, are of a type that was being used later on with Mesa, and uh, anything like from the early 80s would have had a, a different uh, style of capacitor in here. So we're going to try to determine exactly what all modifications were done to this and we will try to give a schematic for the type of modifications that would turn a normal Mesa uh, Mark II B into a Mesa Mark II B+. <clears throat> okay, so literally several hours later, um, this represents several hours of work here. <laughs> Because this thing is just so hard to trace out. It's just the, the giantest pain in the ass ever. Uh, I tried to sort of follow the the general flow of this schematic backwards ass as it is, starting over here on the right-hand side. I mean, and this is another thing. Every other schematic in the universe pretty much starts over here on the left and kind of moves from left to right as you're reading, you know, as if you're reading something. But this one starts from right to left, so okay. Already they're trying to confuse the hell out of people, obviously. Here's our input right here. If we follow the input, uh, we have a one meg ground reference resistor right here. Uh, here's our main ground where everything ties to. This is the ground bus that I've drawn here where everything ties back to ground. Okay, so I'm going to point out some differences here as, along, as we go along. Here's V1A. Uh, we are biased the same. We have a 22 microfarad capacitor here but we have a 220k resistor in series with this capacitor so that's a difference and that's just an oddball little thing that's not present on this schematic not sure why they did that or what the thinking is in this i, I really honestly don't know i think they're trying to maybe find a compromise on the base we have a 100k plate resistor which is the same as we have here. This 100K resistor is present. We have a 0.047, a 0.1, a 250 picofarad, and a 750 picofarad. These two were kind of hard to read, so I'm not sure if they're exact, but they're kind of the same general idea. And then we have this shift switch right here, which seems to be correct. Uh, we have a treble pot that I measured and seems to be about 250K. It was a little bit off from that. 
but seems to be close enough. Uh, the base pot was about 200k rather than the 250k that we see here. I don't know if that's just I don't know because maybe I was measuring something else. I was measuring it in circuit, but I did get 200k on there, so I wrote 200k. Seven and a half k on the mids pot, even though we read 10k here on this schematic, so that's a difference, and that's pretty pretty far off. So I thought I would circle that and note that as well. And on this one, we have this gain boost uh, circuitry here on the original schematic. I'm you know there's a what appears to be a switch here, a gain boost switch that goes direct to ground but if it if it's not switched on we have a 0.005 capacitor and a 33k resistor in parallel to ground instead and right here we have a optional foot switch as well so all of this stuff is not present in this particular example uh, moving along uh, out of the tone stack if we follow this along uh, we got a 100k resistor here coming out of the tone stack, which is present here as well. Then we have a volume pot. It's kind of hard to keep all this straight. We've got a bright cap right here. I did not get the value on the actual one in the amplifier. I'm just going to guess that it's probably about the same. Most bright caps are pretty, pretty well within the 500 to 250 picofarad range. One difference I did see is that we have a one meg resistor though in series with this bright capacitor right here. So that's a that's a difference. That would be further selecting out uh, only the highs in, into this. Uh, we have here, let's see, we're biased on the second stage, 1.5K, uh, which is the same. And we have a 22 microfarad capacitor, which is the same. Uh, coming out of this stage, this is where we have some more differences. Okay, here we have a 330K plate resistor we're showing on this schematic, but up here we have a 100K plate resistor, so that is a distinct difference that needs to be a, a, of note. Uh, coming out of this also we have a 0.05 capacitor uh, coming out of V1B here. Uh, but in this one, we have a series of capacitors. We have a 0 .001 and a 0 .0022 capacitor that are piggybacked on top of one another. So that's going to give, they're going to add together for a total of about 0 .0032 or so uh, capacitance right there. And then there's a switch up here, a little higher, that is a, a labeled a lead shift switch. Uh, that gives us a 0 0.01 capacitor instead of this. So it gives us a little bit bigger capacitor. Then coming out of that, on the other side of this network, we have, uh, it shoots off to A, which uh, picks up down here on the bottom of the schematic because I just didn't have room to draw it. I didn't even realize it was there until I came back around. I drew all this out and got it down to here, and I was like, well, shit, this ties way back the hell up here. So... Anyway, so you, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But coming on the other side of this, so we've got signal at this point still. So we've got signal that would be present right there. We go through a one meg resistor into uh, the lead drive control that will determine the amount of lead drive going to the next stage. We have a 33 nanofarad capacitor going over here to the cathode off of that, which is... A bit odd it's like they're filtering out a bunch of shit right there it's like they just they set a cutoff so 33 nano is is what 0 0.03 0 0.03 microfarad capacity so that's shooting off a lot of signal over here to the cathode which is odd then we've got most of the signal coming up here to the grid um, we come out of the grid we have a hundred K plate resistor here now this is where things get really freaking weird uh let me finish this out we have, so we right here um this is v3b that would be this one we have a 3.3 k uh bias resistor and right here instead of a bright switch and a and a bypass capacitor we just have a 10 microfarad bypass capacitor which looks like it had been um modded in this example, I think, right? 
uh yeah yeah i think it's this one right here so um but again we'll get back to that in a little bit so we're moving along this is kind of where it gets really weird so coming out of v3b and this is actually what's in the amp this is what i've traced out and unless i'm missing something i put my meter on all kinds of shit too so we're you know over here on v4 the, and on the original schematic v4 one two three four down over here okay v4a which is the half that's on this side the half that's on the other side we'll get to in a minute but this half was supposed to be paralleled with the other half so both of these halves were supposed to be paralleled and driving the reverb in this one that is not what we have uh, we have v4a that is acting as and get this okay so we've got the signal here present and we also have high dc voltage here too at this point right so dc voltage comes through a hundred k resistor almost like a plate load resistor into the cathode and not the plate so we're loading the cathode on this instead of the plate uh so we're treating this as a reverse cathode follower so in this example, this is a plate follower. <laughs> That's basically what this stage is like. I don't know if they did this to confuse people. Maybe. Maybe they just did this to confuse people. Why would you not just do this as a as a regular cathode follower? I, I just don't know. So you don't confuse technicians. I think, man, honestly, I think Randall Smith must be the most paranoid motherfucker on planet Earth. I, I, I really do have to believe that. Like, you know, I can understand if you put in a lot of work uh, trying to innovate and come up with ideas and do things differently and all this kind of stuff. But at some point, you have to balance that with, you know, ease of use and ease of finding technicians who can repair your stuff out in the field. And if you have some weird ass shit like this, stuff that's not even the same, it's not even remotely the same as what's on the printed schematic that you can just, that you can get. And I would have to believe if you were to contact Mesa and ask for a Mark II B schematic, this is what they'd send you right here with, with this going on instead of this, which is a, like I said, that's a, that's like a plate follower. So, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's like they're loading down the cathode with a hundred k resistor, and then they've got the signal uh, with a point DC coupled here with a point one capacitor. So we've got um, the DC stopping here and our signal going to the grid, like a normal, like, like a cathode follower. But then it comes out of the cathode okay, or the plate. See, I'm even getting confused talking about it. it comes out of the plate through another capacitor so that's um okay so out out of this <laughs> through another capacitor through a resistor 5.4k and then it shoots off in a couple different directions it goes in this direction through a little network here and then into a mass in the master one volume control and the lead master volume control uh that is switch uh, switched on and off with a relay so when the lead master is engaged it looks like it goes to another gain stage that probably is in parallel i'm i'm guessing anyway this master volume is the load for this part of the circuit okay if we follow our signal this way it goes through the effects send and return so basically it's our signal just jumpers right across down to the return if we have nothing plugged in, of course. And then it goes through this 15K resistor and then down to another uh, another gain stage, this V2A. Now, I haven't drawn anything back this way yet, okay? There's more crap back over this way, too. I have not drawn. This is about as far as I'm going to get at the moment, and this might be as far as I get, period, because I'm, I'm just... You know what? I've been staring at this thing and fucking tracing stuff out, and this is the biggest piece of shit pain in the ass design I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm going to give you one example, okay? With no indications on the board whatsoever of where this fucking thing terminates, I've got a... And excuse my language here, but holy crap, man. Who does this to people? Who does this to technicians except somebody who's super paranoid and you just, you know... 
I don't know, dude. But anyway, we've got, okay, so we've got this point zero two two capacitor right here, the, this big red thing. So it comes over here to a trace, and you can see over here there's a, there's a pad that just kind of terminates and goes nowhere. So I'm like, where the hell does this go? Where does this, where does the signal even pick up? So after prodding around for a little while, I figured out, all right, let's see. And what I, what you have to do basically is it, you put, you put one of your probes on one, the one side you're trying to find out where it goes. And then you just prod around inside the amp until you hit it. Basically, that's the only way to find it. But I figured out it pops up right here. And, you know, from so from there to there, there's nothing. But I think that's where it went. Yeah. Yeah, see, that's what, so that's where it goes to right there. So, you know, but just no indications at all. There's no, like, you know, like little letter there, like a little A and then an A over here or something to indicate, hey, this is where it goes. Nothing like that. <clears throat> And I don't know if Mesa has, maybe they have, to, you know, to be fair, maybe they have more documentation. Like if I were to call them and say, hey, give me, throw, give me, can you give me all the service manual documentation you have on the Mark IIb? Uh, just send me all, everything you got. But I mean, it's very likely that this is what they would send me. They would send me this documentation right here that I already have. And this is, you know, is telling me like all the common things things that go on and all this and I've I've copied this from the one that was uh, with the amp but um you know it's very likely that that's that's what they've got and that's what they would send me now maybe I'm wrong but I kind of doubt it but that's just one example I mean um and when it comes to the uh, mod itself you know we've got this stuff over here that was cut so you've got a trace over here that was actually cut I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it uh, right there so there's a couple pads that were taken out let me get something here let's just show you all right normally I wouldn't poke in this thing with a pencil but that doesn't matter because there's no there's no it's not on um, so you can see this wire that's coming into this trace right here so this trace has been cut so there was more trace right here that brought this over to this junction as well so those two were together but he's cut this and he's also um, cut out what looks like a junction right here with a couple of pads that were there so those are now gone as well on this gain stage we're just going to follow the signal this way we're not going to show anything that's a little further this way there is some more stuff i didn't trace out and there's also some stuff uh, tied into this relay I, I'll show you an interesting one interesting thing I did see when I was uh, poking around in here is that the switching okay the switching is okay you see the foot switch right here so that foot switch plugs in right there and goes to that jack down there on the bottom so we can see this this wire right here comes into the board and it goes to the very bottom tra the bottom most trace on the bottom trace you can see right there there's a four uh, IN4006 diode right there that goes over to the relay so it goes from the switch the foot switch signal over to that relay and then you've got over here you've got uh, it tied up here to this push-pull switch which uh, sends it to ground when it's switched out and that is the lead drive so when you change the lead drive right there uh, when you pull it out um, it basically grounds that and it's just interesting to me because if you follow that out right over here on um, Okay, so on that relay, you've got a resistor over to this point, and then you've got another diode right there that's tied to pin 9 of this tube, and pin 9 is the filament. Now, I haven't thought this entirely through, but it looks like they're possibly turning off the filament for one of the tubes. 
I have a lot of respect for people who are doing their own thing. That's not. I'm, I'm not trying to criticize somebody who's not doing everything like a Fender or Marshall. The point I guess I'm getting at, at least with the schematic stuff, is just that it just seems it just smacks of us of a kind of paranoia that you see uh, people engaging in. You know that they don't want their stuff stolen, and they think everything's going to be stolen, and somebody's out to get them, and somebody's out to steal their shit. And maybe that's true to some degree, but holy shit, anybody who would actually steal this amp couldn't possibly do anything but improve this. You know what I mean? <laughs> they would have to spend so much R&D just improving the fucking layout to make it commercially viable to make it. You know? I mean, honestly, you'd have to be a complete idiot. If I was going to clone something like this, the first thing I would do is just tear one completely apart you know, draw it out on a diagram, basically, and try to come up with a better way of, of laying it out. I mean, so anyway, let's move on. So we've got all this network down here on the cathode on this one, too, which is just oddball. We've got a 10 microfarad capacitor here. Uh, I mean, it's a gain stage. Where is this tied? So this A is tied up here. So we've got we've got like two megs, three megs. Is that can that be right? That seems like a really wild bias for, for that. This this would I mean you would think that this right here would be at ground potential at this point. Let's see. So this point right here is where all this stuff meets. This capacitor is the 10 microfarad. So on so the 10 microfarad comes up here into the air. So that's floating in the air. And then we've got a resist resistor going from that point down. And that is the 330K uh, resistor. So we are looking at... So we're looking at this junction right here. That's on the other side of that 330K right down there. So if I measure from right there... Okay, if I measure from that junction to ground, I'll just put it somewhere on the chassis. Okay, so that is at ground potential. I just did not realize that. Okay, so I can draw that out. Jeez, man. See, this is the thing. I'm just so freaking... I mean, look at this. Look at this, dude. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> look at... Uh. I start, probably started around 10 o'clock doing this, and it's 4 a.m., so I'm, you know... I've, I've kind of lost my marbles here, and I'm, I'm about to go to bed, but I, I just wanted to make this video while everything is still kind of fresh in my mind. Uh, otherwise, I'll just lose it, and I'll completely lose interest in the morning. So here's where we are. Um, so this is ground potential. I can go ahead and draw this to ground. Let's do that. So that orients us a little bit better, uh, makes a little bit more sense for sure. Uh, and that would also explain why this was tied back to A. So we can actually erase that. Well, this, this, A, there's a one meg from here to ground. What are they doing all that for? That just seems so freaking weird. I, I think they're trying to change the... Trying to change the taper of the pot, so that's what they're doing. But anyway, you get you get the idea. I probably should just erase this and just move it up here. If I had a little bit more room, I would just draw that out differently. But you get the idea. Anyway, so coming off of the plate right here, we go through a 0.047 capacitor, pretty standard, into a 22k uh, resistor, which will uh, which will tamp uh, tamp down some highs a little bit. Uh, we skip over here, and then we go to this post effects level control. Actually, right after that control, there's a preamp out, and it also goes to the phase inverter from there. So yeah, man, hopefully this helps somebody because man, it took me hours and hours to produce this video. So <laughs> this is <laughs> so hopefully it does help somebody. And you know, I again, I, I'm not trying to come down on Mesa unduly here or, or harshly in a way that I don't think that they deserve. I, I think they deserve everything I'm saying because this is a pain in the neck. And if you had to get in this thing and do any kind of serious work, if something was really burned up and you were on the road and you had maybe a traveling amp tech or something with you, I mean, even if you were lucky to have an amp tech with you on the road and, and your Mesa, your number one amp or whatever burned up, 
you would be shit out of luck. You really would. You would have to come up with a new rig or you'd have to have a backup. This is not the kind of thing I would want to rely on just because you can't fix it easily. You know, and that's that's the downfall of all this modern shit, too. You know, all the stuff that's been made in the last 25 or 30 years. Or not all of it, but a lot of it. It's just completely unfixable if something breaks, you know? And, and you can't take something like that on the road. You know, I mean, like a modern Mesa, if you open one of those up, I've shown several videos of modern Mesas, and you could see, I'll put a link up here just to one example, okay? Or maybe a couple examples. You can go look at some modern Mesas <laughs> that I've fixed on this channel or attempted to fix or what have you. And man, they're just a they're, they're just a nightmare. There's just so many switches and buttons and knobs, and they try to be everything to everyone, you know, or, or be a Swiss Army knife of a... Of a, of a fucking rig and it just doesn't make practical sense to try to be all things to all people or to try to be a Swiss army knife. The best approach uh, is this and the safest approach if you're about reliability and having a predictable show or spectacle night in night out if you're on the road is to just get something man that's simple um, that's reliable, that's easy to fix, that anybody from here to Timbuktu, if they know anything about electronics, can probably fix it. And that's one reason just to either steer clear of maces altogether, or if you're going to buy maces and use maces, um, maybe just keep them in the studio where they probably belong. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have, uh, please hit like and subscribe down below. It's been really hard for me to get my videos seen of, of late. Leave a comment. Uh, it'll help me in the algorithm, and I appreciate it very, very much, and we'll see y'all later.